just record. There was a few people who couldn't make it, so I'm trying to record it for them. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Jamie, for organizing this and for the great introduction. Um, so, as Jamie said, I'm with the Science um, from Science Exchange. And um, today I really want to tell you about my transition from an academic research position to studying something. Um, so, it was probably only 18 months ago that I was meant to be in the audience of a talk like this. I was at the University of Miami. Um, a junior faculty member there, and really had no idea how do you start a company, what does it involve, all of those types of things. So um, I'm really excited to get to tell you about my journey and um, how quickly you can kind of build a company. Um, Science Exchange is now backed by the same venture capital firm that invested in Facebook, um, Groupon, Airbnb, and Skype. So it's pretty um, exciting to sort of see what progress you can make um, in such a short amount of time. So today I want to talk about um, 10 lessons that I'm going to provide from my journey and then I'm actually going to provide case studies for those lessons from uh, my experience with Science Exchange. And then I'm also going to give some practical tips for each of those lessons about how you can apply um, that lesson to your own journey. So if you're thinking about starting a company. So um, I already had a bio given about me. So the main thing is that I am an academic researcher myself um, and then left academic research to form a science exchange um, and just recently the reproducibility initiative. So I wanted to just quickly say what science exchange is since I'm going to be using it for the case studies so kind of, <laughs> kind of need to know what it is. So um, science exchange is a marketplace for scientific experiments and by that I mean that essentially it's a really big database of core facilities and commercial service providers. Uh, we have more than a thousand core facilities that are part of the Science Exchange Network um, from over 200 US universities. So it's a really great way to be able to easily find, search, and access um, any kind of scientific experiment that you need done um, from basically any university. And this is our home page. It just shows what it looks like to come to Science Exchange. Um, we try to provide all the information that you need to make a decision about ordering a service, and then we also provide entertainment so that it's actually um, the whole integrated solution. So these are the 10 lessons I'm going to talk about today. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to go over each of the lessons and then provide a practical tip for them as well. So just a quick disclaimer, Science Exchange is an online marketplace, so it's a website, it's not a biotech company. So <laughs> the lessons I'm going to give today apply to my own experiences. Um, I tried to make them you know, pretty general in the sense that they should apply to most aspiring entrepreneurs, but just wanted to make that quick disclaimer. So the first lesson is to solve your own problem. So the best companies are the ones that solve the problem of one of the founders. And um, I'm going to give this quote from Paul Graham, one of the founders of Y Combinator, a startup accelerator program in Silicon Valley that we took part in. And he said the best problems to solve are the ones that affect you personally. And this is because you really have a great understanding of the problem and you're really motivated and passionate to solve that problem. So that's my first um, lesson. And for the case study about science exchange, obviously I created science exchange to solve my own problem, which was the inability to access core facilities efficiently um, through an online marketplace. So when I was doing my research, I increasingly needed access to core facilities. Almost all my projects as a breast cancer researcher involved um, certain aspects that I couldn't do myself, from pathology, to mouse xenographs, to microarray analysis, to bioinformatics. I couldn't possibly know all of these techniques um, or be an efficient expert at them. So I was always using core facilities. And then um, eventually I found that um, I had a flow cytometry experiment that we didn't have the right um, flow cytometry to do, to do it at my own institution. Um, and then I had to look outside the university. It was really, really difficult. So. Um, first of all, I was just Googling around oh, who has got this piece of equipment, and then I was trying to contact them and ask them if they could do the experiment for me or if I could use their piece of equipment. And it was just all around a really bad situation. So I thought, this is actually you know, a, a problem that I would love to have solved for me. I would wish there was an online site that just told me this is everything that's available, this is how much it costs, and you can ask somebody to do it for you who's actually an expert. Um, and so that's why I created Science Exchange, to solve my own problem. So my practical tip is to look around you for inspiration and think about what startup do you wish existed. So my second 
second lesson is to solve a real problem. And by this I mean that it's pretty much the same amount of work to start a, a small company as it is to start a big company. So you can make a company that's going to solve a problem for a few people or it's going to solve a problem for lots of people and it's pretty much the same amount of work. Um, this is the um, quote that I want to use for this problem, which is from, for this lesson, which is from Aaron Patzer, the founder of Convince.com. What set us apart from 95% of other startups is that we served a real need. So you really want to look at um, the fact that you are addressing a real problem. And with Science Exchange, it was clear um, that collaborative research and the use of core facilities, the use of commercial service providers, was becoming increasingly important for research. So the idea of a single researcher doing everything themselves to their own lab is just not true anymore, as we all know. Um, so this is for a variety of reasons, but mostly driven by the increased specialization and multidisciplinary nature of the type of research that we're doing now. So uh, people outsource their research because they don't have access to the right skills or equipment for the experiment. They want to do something in a more cost-effective way, so they don't want to purchase a piece of equipment for a one-off experiment, or they just want to get more research done. We know as a postdoc, it's a highly competitive environment, everybody wants to get lots and lots of papers, and it can be a much quicker way to accumulate enough data to get um, more papers more quickly. So uh, when I started to research into the amount of money that was being spent at core facilities and commercial service providers, it now exceeds 10% of the NIH budget. So over $3 billion every year in the US is spent at these facilities. So it's clear that it is a really big uh, market. So actually creating a efficient way to access it is solving a really big problem. So my um, practical tip is to do your market research. And this is something that scientists and researchers are really well trained to do. Um, it's kind of just like when you're thinking about doing um, a new project, you do all your research and literature and figure out what's already been done, what do you want to do that's different. It's the same thing. So look at the size of the market, look at, look at what existing solutions are already there. Um, look at the trends. Is there a need for your solution? Is it growing? Is it decreasing? Why? All these things are important to work out if you are solving a real problem. My third lesson is to share your idea. And so I don't know if any of you kind of have the same thought, maybe it's just me, but when I first thought about science exchange, I thought, hmm, this is a really good idea. Maybe I shouldn't tell anybody because they steal it. So um, having been around startups for um, a whole year, being around tons of founders, I realized that the chances of this happening are now pretty much zero. So um, you know, despite what you see in the Facebook movie, it's very unlikely that somebody will steal your idea because it comes down to the fact that your idea, if it's a good one, probably thousands of people have had it, and execution is everything. So um, it's really important to share your idea and get feedback on whether it is actually solving a real problem. Um, and also because the startup community is very friendly, so other founders who have found successful companies are willing to provide their advice to people who are just starting out, but they can't help you unless you share their, your idea with them. So this is a quote from Thomas Edison, the value of an idea lies in the using of it. And I really like this quote because it applies to a lot of the lessons I'm talking about today. But in particular for sharing your idea, I think it's really about the fact that your idea itself is pretty much valueless unless you share it and can actually work out if your company is going to be um, solving a real problem and actually, you know, then you can actually do something about it. So my um, lesson from Science Exchange is that it was actually sharing my idea that actually crystallized the whole concept of science exchange. So I was talking with a person who actually ended up being one of my co-founders of science exchange. So he was from a completely different background, um, an MIT MBA who was working at a startup. And I was telling him, oh, it's so difficult to find all these things that I need to do my experiments and I want to have access to these experts and you know, it's just no efficient way to find them. And he said, yeah, I have that same problem, you know, as a startup, we're always looking for web developers and computer programmers and lawyers and accountants, but it's actually quite easy for us because there's online marketplaces for the things that we need to access these specialists. So he told me about this company called ODES, and I said, well, why isn't there an ODES for science, for science experiments? And so essentially that was where the whole kind of concept of science exchange came from. Um, and then I went on to share that idea with a ton of other scientists. I spoke about it at conferences, I talked um, at lab meetings, I emailed all of my you know, network of scientists' friends and asked them if they thought it was a good idea. And so I really wanted to see, is this something you would actually use? And all of them were, for the most part, extremely excited about the concept. And so I realized that it 
was actually a real problem that needed to be solved. So my practical tip is to talk about your idea at every opportunity you can. And for some of us, that's actually quite difficult, so you really have to push yourself. Um, but you never know what it's going to lead to. My fourth lesson is to build the right team. And this obviously ties back to my lesson to share your idea. So you should start building your team as soon as possible. Um, you really want to find some co-founders who are going to help you build your company. It's um, really difficult for a single founder to be successful at building a company. In fact, there's um, very few examples of really big successful companies that were founded by a single founder. And that's probably not a coincidence. Um, you know, it takes a lot of effort to get a company off the ground, and it takes a diverse set of skills. So, you know, an individual having all of those skills to do it, um, you know, it's, it's somewhat unlikely. So, Scott Heitemann, the co-founder of Meetup, he said you need a team that's going to care about this thing as much as you do. So it's really important that your co-founders also share your vision for the company and really want to solve the same problem that you do. So with Science Exchange, we founded Science Exchange with three co-founders and they're all very diverse. So myself, a scientist, then we have um, Dan Knox, the MIT MBA, and Ryan Abbott, who's a computer programmer from Michigan State. So a very diverse team, but we were all really passionate about creating a marketplace that could make science much more efficient. And they really shared my vision and frustration at the way that research is often done so inefficiently. Um, and one of the good things about our founding team was that we had a really diverse set of skills. So we were pretty much able to solve any of the problems that sort of um, we faced when we were starting the company, including examples like incorporation, Dan knew how to do that, um, building a website, Ryan knew how to do that, finding and talking to scientists, I knew how to do that. So it was kind of this great complementary set of skills that was brought together by the founding team. So my practical tip is to mix with people outside your field of expertise. Um, so how you can do this is to go to meetups. There's lots of different events that people do um, who are interested in entrepreneurship, and um, a great place to find them is at meetup.com. My fifth lesson is to get the right advisors, and by this I also mean investors. So investors aren't just a source of money. In fact, um, I would say that if you can at all avoid it, you should never just take what's called dumb money. So the idea that someone's just giving you money and that's going to help your business succeed, that's probably not you know, the right investor for you. You should look for investors that can really help you, so they need to be able to provide the right context and be able to provide, provide the right advice. And the best venture capital firms now um, are actually led by investors who have transitioned out of being successful company founders themselves. So they can really share a lot of their lessons with their success with you. And I think this is a really nice quote from Liz Stone, the co-founder of Twitter. Investors are employees you can never fire. We make sure to pick investors that feel like us. So I wholeheartedly agree with this. Um, with Science Exchange, we were very careful with our investors. We, um, all of our investors are from technology companies, so they um, include the VCs that funded Airbnb, OpenTable, eBay. So these are all online marketplaces that were big success stories. And we wanted their experience in creating these types of marketplaces rather than um, what would have traditionally people would have encouraged is probably to take funding from the sort of people who would fund biotech companies. And I actually think that the sort of challenges that we face are much more similar to something like, a, like eBay or OpenTable being a biotech startup. So um, my practical tip is that for us, we took part in Y Combinator, the Startup Accelerator Program, and this was really invaluable for us in terms of making the right connections to the right investors and the right advisors. So um, I would strongly encourage you to look at what resources are available, and there are a lot of incubator and startup programs now available. Um, so you should definitely look into them and see if they make a good fit for the company that you're thinking of founding. And you can also um, look at local entrepreneurship clubs. They have a lot of um, advices that can give you advice about the types of um, programs that are available. Lesson number six is get stuff done. And I can't really put it better than um, Greg Wilson, who's a prominent VC. And he said, if you want to create something great and do it faster than the competition, you need to be action orientated. So it's very easy for um, you to to basically think about all of the things that you need to get done and just get overwhelmed. And you kind of think, oh my god, it's just like this, how am I going to start a company?
needed so many things that we had to, you know, uh, that I had to think about to do, and you sort of then get into this trap where you just don't get stuff done. And the way I think about it as a scientist is that it's kind of like when you start your new project and it's sort of this gigantic, overwhelming project, but you break it up into the different experiments that you're going to do, and then you do those experiments, and pretty pretty quickly you actually make progress, and you see when the project actually progress and take shape. Um, so with Science Exchange, the um, lesson that I want to give from our experience was that we tried to get stuff done really quickly. We went from the idea to the launch in um, just five months. So our idea started in March 2011. We wrote um, our application for Y Combinator in April. We built the product from May to August and launched in August, and then raised our seed finance around in September. And so since then, we've grown to more than 1,000 core facilities at 200 universities. We've had more than a quarter of a million site visits, and we've had hundreds of projects that have gone to the site. So it really is possible to get stuff done really quickly. Um, my practical advice, which I actually you know, learned myself, it wasn't something that somebody gave to me, it's something that I've used and really found very beneficial, is to record what you really need to achieve at the beginning of each week, and then at the end, just check that you actually did achieve those goals. Um, the great thing about doing that is then you can sort of track your progress. So over time, in six months, you can look back and say, Oh, I feel like I haven't achieved anything. <laughs> you look back and you see, wow, I was thinking about doing that and that and that, and I've done it all. So it's a great way for you to see what you can accomplish when you really do get stuff done. So my seventh lesson is to use your time wisely. So another way to kind of use your time wisely is to do fewer things. So when you start your company, you really need to do only the things that are really essential right then for the success of your company. So, um, you know, a really good example that I think of all the time is that there's all these things that seem really urgent, but they're actually not that important. So, answering uh, emails, that's the perfect example. So, when I was a postdoc, I would get maybe 30 emails from that today, now I literally get hundreds of emails every single day, and I could literally spend my whole day just answering emails. So, you really have to think about how you use your time and have strategies to make sure that you are doing the things that matter right then for the success of your business. Um, for use your time wisely, the lesson from Science Exchange is really why did I create Science Exchange? And the whole point of Science Exchange is to help scientists use their time more wisely. I constantly felt frustrated when I was doing my postdoc that um, you know a lot of the time I spent uh, very unwisely. I was doing experiments that anybody could have done that didn't really use my level of training at all. So doing hundreds of DNA extractions, I kind of felt like a robot could have done it. Um, and then, on the other hand, there was times when I spent you know, a great deal of effort learning a specific technique that I was only going to use for one experiment. So, um, I think that you know, in a highly competitive environment like science or like in a startup, it's the people who really make, who use their time wisely who win. So they're the ones um, who do things the most efficiently, the most quickly, and the most cost effectively. They are the success stories. My practical tip is to make use of experts so that you are using your time most wisely. And so there's a lot of marketplaces for businesses where they can actually access all of the different experts they need. Things like Odesk, Elan, Scripted, 99 Designs, there's accounting. These offer everything you can think of that you need in terms of the skill set for your business. Um, and obviously for Science Exchange. For Science Experiments, there's now Science Exchange. So lesson number eight is to do things that don't scale. And when I first put this lesson in, I thought, mm, does that kind of contradict use your time wisely? But I really think it doesn't. So um, the key thing about doing things that don't scale is that you have to use your time wisely in the sense that you don't want to over-optimize. So until you've proved out that you actually need something and um, you understand the process, you don't want to build a really technical solution to it. It's just kind of like, you know, not a great use of your time. And um, this is famously kind of portrayed by Brian Chesky from Airbnb, who said, do things that won't scale, it will teach you. And his story is really a great lesson for doing things that don't scale. So um, Airbnb is a website where you can book um, people's spare room. So just like any person can list their room on it and other people book it. And what he found when he was starting Airbnb was that he really needed high quality photos. So people needed to put really nice photos up for their rooms or else people don't want to book them. So he um, was actually a professional photographer. So 
So he went out initially, the founder went out and took photos of all of these rooms because he really wanted them to have you know, very nice, very high quality images. And once he did that, um, those were the rooms that always got booked. So he kind of saw, oh, this effort was really worthwhile. Well, obviously it wouldn't scale. The founder can't go out and take photos of every single person's house. But um, it taught him that that was important for the success of the business. And he then went out and um, now they hire a whole team of photographers, so professional photographers in each city that go out and take photos of people's apartments where they live in the Airbnb. So that's a great um, example of using this lesson to um, the success of your business. So for Science Exchange, when we first started, we didn't know how payments would work. So how does a researcher pay a core facility that they're working with? Um, so we did it all manually. But once we understood the systems and the processes that actually occur in between um, payment between university and non-university, we were able to build a payment platform that allows researchers to easily submit their payment to Science Exchange via purchase order, credit card, or check, and then we take care of paying the core facility. So my practical tip is to focus on your first 1,000 users, not your first 1 million users. And so this is really a way of focusing in on getting great feedback from the user experience and learning from them, and um, as part of that you need to make your personal customer a really big priority so that you can learn from your early users and really get them um, to buy into the product. So my ninth lesson is don't give up. And I saw a really great talk recently from Jeremy Howard from Kaggle, one of the other um, startups that we're good friends with in San Francisco. And he basically said the only way that a startup fails is just kind of two ways. One is that they run out of money or they give up. So don't run out of money and don't give up, and you'll <laughs> succeed. That was kind of his like sort of flippant take on the whole startup process. And you know, I think that I do agree with that. Those other two ways to fail. Um, it's really important to not give up. Starting a startup is hard, um, but I can honestly say that when I was doing my PhD, I wanted to give up many more times than I wanted to give up with founding Science Exchange. So. It's really not as hard as you think it's going to be, particularly for scientists who've kind of gone through that struggle and had to really show that perseverance that everyone does show when they go through you know, a very long PhD program. So um, my quote is from Steve Jobs, sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick, don't lose faith. For Science Exchange, we, uh, when we launched in August last year, we initially had a ton of press coverage which um, proclaimed Science Exchange as an eBay for science. And you might think, oh, well, that sounds great, you know, hold us a press coverage. But actually, we had a really negative reaction from the core facilities about this. Um, and we had to work really hard to convince them that, you know, we were there for the benefit of core facilities and researchers and um, to convince them to actually join the network. So we didn't give up. We spent a lot of time building really great products for the core facilities and really listening to them about what they want. And we now have more than 1,000 core facilities that are part of the Science Exchange Network because we didn't give up. So um, I think the practical tip comes back to making sure that you're recording your progress so that when things get really hard, you're able to go back and check and see, oh, I've already made so much progress, okay. Kind of gives you that you know, sense of reassurance that things are going okay. And also making sure that you have that good advisor network because then you can go back to them and say, I'm facing this problem, I'm really thinking about giving up, and they can give you their advice of how they solved a similar problem and they eventually succeeded. So always remember that founding a startup is hard, but persistence is everything. My tenth lesson is that scientists make great entrepreneurs. And this is something that I never learned when I was a scientist. No one ever told me, oh, you know what, scientists are actually kind of trained to be entrepreneurs. You know, a lot of what you do is like running your own lab is similar to starting a company. So the skills that we learn as scientists, problem solving, persistence, the ability to pivot, creative creativity, grant writing, all these things are things that you do when you run a startup. So actually, the training that you've put in place as a scientist has prepared you well to be a really great entrepreneur. So I think Paul Graham would actually probably, you know, he's a tech incubator. He wouldn't even think about the fact that this quote can be applied to this lesson, and that is that startups are like science, where you need to follow the trail wherever it leads. So those are my 10 lessons, um, and I'm now going to just give you a little bit of resources in terms of like things that you can actually go to and look up specific pieces of information about incorporation and all of the legal things about starting a company. Um, my slides are actually available on SlideShare, so you don't need to take any notes, you can just download them. 
Um, for general startup advice, I would strongly recommend reading Paul Graham's essays on startups. These are very famous essays and have been used really widely in terms of what does it actually mean to start a startup. So the two most famous ones are how to start a startup and what a startup is really like. So I would strongly recommend reading those. Um, in terms of actually all of the legal stuff, how do you incorporate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the main thing is to incorporate as a Delaware C Corp. This is really important for um, if you're ever going to take any venture capital. It's almost required that you're set up in this way. Um, it's really easy to incorporate in this way. There's lots of templates. I've got links to them here. We incorporated Science Exchange in one afternoon. So um, very easy. The only thing that really matters for your incorporation is that you think about the equity split for the founding team. So this is obviously really individual for each company. and lot of factors, but um, the one point I would make is that for, with Science Exchange we split the equity equally between the three founders, even though you know, some people say, oh, what if it's more in the year, you know, why did you do that? But um, for me, I thought, well, you know, we're all giving up good jobs, we are all taking on significant risk to do it, and ultimately a startup is either a gigantic success or a huge failure. So, you know, a small percentage of difference is really not going to matter. What really matters is to motivate everybody equally as a team. So that you succeed because the founding team is the most essential thing to the success of your company. In fact, 65% of startups that do give up and fail are caused by founder disagreements. So really important that you're motivating the founding team, and making sure no one feels you know, ripped off or that they're not is important. Um, anybody who takes equity in the company should be subject to vesting. Vesting has now become pretty much standard in Silicon Valley and it should apply to any startup. What it means is that you essentially earn your equity. So um, with Science Exchange, we have a four-year vesting period. That means that um, no one has equity in the company until they've worked there for one year. Then they get a quarter of the equity. They work for another year. They get another quarter, etc. And that's really important because it's catastrophic to the company if a founder leaves the company early on with a huge equity stake. So they could have 20 or 30 percent of the company, and then the other two founders are left trying to build this company for the benefit of somebody who's no longer working there. So that protects you from that happening. It's really, really important. So um, I just wanted to also follow on from that by saying that the startup community is really helpful. We do all want to you know, see other people succeed. And I'm more than happy to give advice um, about my experience if you think that I can be helpful or if you think anybody else from the Science Exchange, Exchange team can be helpful, then feel free to contact me at Elizabeth at scienceexchange.com. We also have a science advocate program, which is a great way to show an interest in entrepreneurship, to show, get experience of what you start actually to do, what things can you put on your CV as being involved with. So uh, being a science exchange advocate, um, we have a whole, basically we say, do what you, know, you think is going to benefit your career. So some of our advocates do things like write blog posts for science exchange, some of them go to conferences, some of them do um, product testing and we're releasing a new feature. So all of these things are obviously super useful to us, but also useful for our advocates to learn what is it actually involved with working at a startup. Um, so again, I want to reiterate that I'm really happy to help, and you can contact me at Elizabeth at scienceexchange.com. And I wouldn't be a good entrepreneur if I didn't say that anybody who's a scientist here should definitely check out Science Exchange. It's super useful for your research, and um, I really wish that it existed when I was doing my first talk. So finally, I'm going to end with um, photos of the Science Exchange team in action. Um, one of the things I think is so important is to have fun. And you know, this is your one opportunity to work with the people you want to work with and to solve the problem you want to solve. So um, you're really going to make the most of it. Thank you very much. So while he's uh, just connecting, uh, her slides are available on a service called slideshare.net. You can find them there if you, um, and yeah, if you search science exchange. And Williams will also be there as well. Hi, everybody. I'm William Gunn. Uh, thanks, Jane, for organizing this. Uh, excited to come and talk to you guys. Uh, Elizabeth told you a little bit about her experience of starting a company. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience um, uh, leaving uh, grad school and working at a biotech company and also working at a um, tech startup. Um, 
any of you have maybe have heard career seminars from people who have spent many years doing really impressive things at big companies. We still have more experience kind of behind the bench than we do in business, so um, I hope that you know, at least our experience is a little more directly relevant than someone who made the transition to us 15 years ago. Um, first of all, I want to ask, um, how many people here are currently looking for a tenure track position or hoping to get one? Okay, just a show of hands. Nice. So running about 20%. So um, the National Academies of Science did this study where they they asked, um, you know, um, they looked at people and their career trajectories and everything, and they found that 80% of people uh, who enter graduate school end up doing something other than taking a tenure track position. Um, and most of that's by choice, people leaving even when there are you know, positions available for them. So you guys are representative. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and how I got started. You know, when I started um, uh, my research career as an undergrad, I wanted to go into grad school. I didn't, didn't really even think of doing anything other than being like in the research track, you know, um, moving down that road. And so all the things that I talked about before I started grad school, you know, as I was going through was things that were relevant to that, like how you pick a good lab, how you pick a good project, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, like one of the, the things when you're just starting out, obviously, or going to a new place, um, you know, find some, a place that's stable, that's well funded. You know, uh, another good tip that's useful all the way through is diversify your project risk. You know, work on some things that are really be awesome if they worked out, but they're a little risky. Work on some things that are a little bit more like reliable, and you know that you would get a result if the other stuff doesn't pan out. But some of the other advice I got, or rather the lack of advice, was. Um, you know, just kind of keep your head down, work really hard, and you know, it, 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 it's going to all be fine, right? Um, and it's not because there's actually not going to be you know, tenure track positions for the vast majority of people going through um, graduate programs. And they can't give you any advice on about what else to do because the people that are in the program, the tenure track researchers, that's all they know. So you have to look elsewhere to get this kind of advice. Um, so, you know, um, as I was there and you know, keeping my head down and, and working, and um, you know, I just finished this major um, uh, project and was thinking about, you know, starting this next uh, bit that was really, really intensive and a lot of pathology that I didn't know too much about, a lot of, you know, fancy immunostains and techniques I had to invent to do, uh, to do this work, and, um, and our lab was moving from uh, Louisiana to Texas, there's all this stuff going on. And I was like, you know, I've been in grad school for four years, about now, I've published a couple papers. Maybe I should, you know, think about leaving it and I talk to my PI and he's like, oh yeah, it's a good idea. So let's, you know, set up some, um, like, uh, postdoc interbar for use for you and, and this sort of thing, right? Um, at no point did we ever discuss, like, you know, well, what do you really want to do? Or do you want to go, you know, into, do a postdoc? Is that what, you know, what's right for you? And we never discussed that, right? But it turns out that I had a friend who was starting a biotech company out in San Diego. And, you know, I had to talk to him about some of the problems, because he was an engineer, and I knew the biological side of stuff. And, you know, he had me out to do some little consulting stuff. Um, and I thought, well, you know, while they're moving, um, you know, I could go out there and do this. And, you know, if I moved, I would take me a year to kind of get back up to speed. And so I had this little like, time where I could go out and do this consulting stuff and then come back, you know, into, into academia. And that didn't happen. So when I joined the startup, um, it was amazing. Like, I was used to doing this research. Um, and then, like, the research that you do sometimes, you know, most of it or a fraction of it, you know, that you select makes its way into a paper. And then a subset of that makes its way into a grant. Yeah, I was even lucky enough that some of the, the work that I did, um, they uh, filed a patent on and it's going to make its way into clinical trials and may, you know, seven or eight years from now, end up actually you know, helping patients with multiple myeloma. But in this company, on a daily basis, you know, the, the work that I did, the feasibility studies and the assays and the proof of concept stuff, would be taken by the engineers and they would redesign the instrument. Like, I would present results to the founders of the company, and they would change their business plan. They would change the markets they're trying to address on a daily basis. 
So like having that kind of immediate, real-time, tangible impact and feedback is just really kind of a, a fascinating experience. One of the things I like the best about, about working there. But you should know, you know, unless you're in like a really tight um, hub like Silicon Valley for a tech startup or Cambridge or something like that for a biotech startup, it's cool. probably going to be a little isolated. You're mostly going to be on your own. You're not going to have your buddies down the hall in the other lab, you know. There's not going to be these interesting speakers coming through and that sort of thing. So um, you will need to know how to like you know, develop your your, uh, your network a little bit more. So I didn't stay at the biotech company either, as it turned out, because what I found was that at this small company, you know, you, at a start, you have to do tons and tons of different things. You have to learn new things all the time. And um, the things that I, were, that I was really good at doing that I started with, you know, um, we started moving on from there. And so instead of doing amino assays, um, by the time I left, I was coupling small molecules to proteins and DNA, coupling those to substrates, doing more chemistry than biology. And while it was fascinating and really interesting, I started to wonder, like, am I going the wrong way? Is this going to set me up for, for failure or in me a kind of leave me beached up like this dead end kind of a part of, of my career? Because I didn't really feel like that the way I was going was the way I wanted to go. Yeah, I was learning things, but is that kind of the direction I want to move in? So um, I encourage everyone to read this guy. Um, you don't have to be able to pronounce his last name to understand his ideas. <laughs> Uh, but basically what he's done is he's gone through and he's interviewed uh, uh, like athletes, artists, um, researchers, businessmen, um, filmmakers, all of these people, um, and asked them like, what were the circumstances around? What did it feel like when you're really, really in the zone and you're super productive? And the common thread that came out of all of his experiences was that when you're in a situation where you're doing interesting work and your abilities, you know, and your inclinations are well matched to the kind of um, challenges and uh, questions that you're faced with. It's when you're really kind of like right in that, and like it's all, you're not doing super repetitive, boring work, but you're not like totally out of your comfort zone either. And so finding that zone and being able to get into flow is really a key for, for productivity and success. And so you want to be in a career that allows you to find that. Um, so I had been practicing this sort of you know, diversification strategy even after I left. I was working at a startup, and when you're at a startup, you're never really quite sure um, you know, how if the business is going to be successful or not. I mean, when you're doing research, you never know if your experiment's going to work, but it's not like if your experiment doesn't work, you, know, you get sent home and you have to you know, find something else, so they cut off your grant or whatever. Um, so um, you have to try a lot of different things. That was just, Consulting and other things as well. Um, but one of the things that I've always been passionate about was um, sort of how research worked. You know, uh, you have all these fancy tools in the lab, like uh, focal microscopy and all this cool, you know, these cool things. But the place that your work actually gets published, the academic databases and all this kind of stuff, are crappy. Like you could even go online and say, "Show me all the papers that have cited this one," and like get that in a usable format. And it's really frustrating. To uh, so I would write blog posts about this alongside the little, you know, like industry summaries, summaries that I write for my blog, just because it's interesting to me that I met some other people through that. Um, and we would talk about these things, and we would try all the new tools as they would come out and everything. Um, and so Victor Henning, who is one of the founders of the company I work for now, Mendeley, dropped into um, this discussion group on FriendFeed that we were having about reference tools and why they were all crappy and everything. And um, said, hey guys, why don't you try this? And so we tried it and we said, this really sucks. You know, this is what you need to do to make it better. The next week he came back and said, try this again. And we said, well, that's better, but it still sucks. And he kept coming back, you know, iterating, like and getting basically proof that, okay, this approach fails, you need to try something else on a rapid cycle. And, and it kept getting better. And I saw, just from him doing this, uh, a chance of like, hey, this is actually be an opportunity here for, for me to guide him to make a tool based on like what the research community really, really needs because here I am doing research and I know these guys who have great ideas, but nobody is out there implementing them because we weren't developers. Hey, we can funnel our feedback to this guy and get him to do something, you know, help them make something that works for us. And, and so basically I made that um, pitch to Victor and, um, you know, 
started with the, the Mindelay team just part time at, at the time. And um, now, you know, just three years later, um, I've written briefs to the NIH in support of their open access policy. Um, and um, now, you know, the, uh, the NIH is mandating open access for all of their funded work. They're going to extend that to all the other federal grant funding organizations. And the entire UK mandates this as well. So it's been a huge tidal wave shift that I've been able to be a part of here. And we also have a you know, uh, paper writing reference management tool that I would like to say does not suck. So you know, I feel like I've been able to, to achieve a little bit there. Um, so just you know, to tell you about some of the things that we've, we've done and kind of how I brought that mission to, to Mendeley, uh, we, have, we have designed this tool that just takes all of your PDFs um, and research and stuff. And you Throw it in there, extracts out the metadata, and builds a database locally for you so you can easily write papers and just kind of have, make your citations and stuff. But it also aggregates all of the bibliographic data and the leadership stats and everything in the cloud. And so not only do you have a tool that helps you better as a researcher just to, to do your work, but it makes the process of science, that, that thing that I was interested in improving, a little bit better, more collaborative, more transparent, and has resulted in, you know, um, for the first time ever, really, this wide, openly licensed, you know, um, API-backed catalog of the world's research from across all databases. 300 million documents have been uploaded by 2 million researchers at this point. Um, so the scale of this is really something just totally impressive, and that's been in three years, just a, for comparison. It took um, Elsevier about 20 years to assemble their catalog, of that, that was 40 million times. But what you'll notice about my career path here is that like, there wasn't too much traditional about it, right? There was no um, polishing up the CV and applying for jobs, interviewing, doing all of that. All of that was, was missing. So all the things that like even a career development office could help you with, it pretty much didn't exist in my path. I had to, to just kind of you know, go and do the things that I was passionate and look for opportunities and, and kind of you know, create my own course, so to speak. It was my blog that got me my job, basically. So um, I encourage all of you to think about, you know, um, beyond the, um, the, basically all the advice you're getting at this point. Um, and that probably would have been true even if I had ended up at a pharmaceutical company, because all of the real needs that I got um, were um, based on, like, you know, me interviewing people for blog posts about things that I was interested in. So it was really true even if I ended up at Novartis or somewhere. So if you're thinking about, you know, should I stay or should I go, what am I going to do? I just have a few points that you can think about. Um, so for stay, um, if you could do anything that you wanted to be doing right now, would you be doing what you're doing? Um, if the answer is yes, maybe this is the right place for you. Maybe you'll be able to find uh, a flow there. If you have actually a realistic impression of what's required for you, not now, but you know, five years into the future, you have a supportive network that's going to help you, you know, overcome the obstacles as you get to them. Um, so it'll help you write better grants, help you find opportunities, new positions, and that sort of thing. And also, you know, age is a factor. The average age that someone gets their first R1 grant is 42 um, and climbing. So like that that is an issue that you have to think about, right? Um, things on the side of go. Uh, are you frustrated by kind of a lack of having a real tangible impact. Um, do you like to write? I mean, everybody likes to write grants, but if you like to write blog posts and you like to, to communicate, maybe, um, you know, pursue that opportunity. And I was tweeting Elizabeth's talk just about the last hour. Nature Medicine tweeted, you know, out saying, hey, um, we have some openings at Nature Medicine for an editor. So, you know, would anybody like to apply? Here's the link, right? So there's all kinds of things that are out there. Um, if you're interested in science policy, the AAAS is a wonderful science policy fellowship program. It's really fascinating. You know, and has anyone ever told you this? I was actually told this um, as a graduate student. My professor, his, his theory apparently was that if your data is good enough, he can convince himself of what it means, even if you do a crappy job of presenting it. So the theory was like, you know, don't you know try to be too persuasive because that's like being, you know, I don't know what it's. It's just weird. Maybe I think he was just used to people giving such bad presentations. But I think that's still a problem. I think giving a good presentation shows respect for your 
audience. So show respect to pros. Learn how to be a good communicator. Um, it'll help you out a lot. Now, once you've made the decision that you want to go, it's not, don't think academia versus industry, because that is totally a false dichotomy. There's a whole you know, spectrum of things that you, that you can do out there. Um, it's not like, oh, well, I guess I'll go work for a pharma company. But to find out kind of the whole spectrum of things, you really do have to look beyond what you know, what you have access to now. You have to do this thing called networking, which is not you know, like standing around at mixers and events and talking to people. Networking is a, a really broad activity. It's basically do interesting things that you know, interest people that who didn't notice it and you then have some contact with. Um, and then remember you, right? Um, from my blog, I write like analysis pieces and summaries of research about personal genomics. I ended up talking to some people who knew way, way more about that and were way more, more well connected than I was. And you know, now I'm happy to call some of those people my colleagues. And so that's great. That did, a blog is a fantastic networking tool in addition to teaching you good communication skills and you know helping to. Um, Make you, you know, like more aware of what's going on, to keep you up to date on the news, that kind of thing. So, and uh, Nature actually has a great blog called Zubak Science. It has all these stories from people and their transition stories. So there's a startup founder on there, there's a filmmaker on there, there's, uh, you know, people that worked at large pharma companies all there on this, uh, this site. And you can go and get this URL and kind of write it down. It'll be in the slides and stuff. Uh, so people talk a lot about networking. You've probably all heard it's important to network. In business, people are always reaching out. You'll hear this term a lot. And um, you know, so I figured I would just kind of give you a basic um, description. Reaching out is just basically you tapping your network, going to people that you know you've made contact with, and, and volunteering something, interesting, getting yourself involved somehow, asking them, you know, or asking them to help you volunteer to uh, or help organize a symposium or or a conference, uh, you do things with the local biotech club. I know in, in Cambridge they have Mass Bio, um, you have a post office association, those sorts of things. You can you know, volunteer to give a speaking tour about your experiences. So um, once you found that by doing the networking and outreach and everything, um, there's just a few things that I can share from my experiences that what I'm like, how to make the transition not quite so jarring. Uh, understand that the goals are different, the whole mindset of business is different, and particularly like how your time is managed is very, very different than in uh, postdoc or uh, in grad school. So, you know, I came from a really big lab, we had million dollar grants, and we were told sometimes like, hey, this grant's right now, we have to go spend this money on stuff. Um, and so you think of things to go spend the money on. In a business, obviously, it's different because it all comes off the, the bottom line. But if you can think of um, and make a really good business case or something, you can buy a lot of really cool toys and you build a really impressive program. So there's an exciting opportunity for that. Um, now, the largest part of any business's budget is going to be its payable. And if you're paying you know, something more than like a graduate student stipend to pay real industry money, they're going to be expecting a whole lot from you. So it's not going to be like, oh, well, you know, let me reduce this experiment to get like a publication quality you know, block for this or something. You pretty much have to to do it, do it as best you can. The decision will be made based on, you know, what you were able to achieve, and then you move on to the next thing, you know, and you iteratively improve. So the time pressure is a very, very uh, different story. And then the other thing is you're going to be working always on a team. You're not going to be like, you know, hired as a researcher and then put in a lab and you go to your research kind of um, solo. It's very much going to be a team thing. We're going to have people like engineers on your team who think very differently from a research. So you won't be able to. So when I just when I first started, I was throwing up these kind of theoretical considerations. You're like, oh, well, I don't think you should do it this way because this might happen or that might happen. And engineers don't want to hear that. They want to see something fail, you know. And if it works, they're happy with it. They don't care why, you know. Like, so and you also want to have people like like marketers on your team. And so, like for the salespeople, if you want them to understand, you know, how something works, and they don't go out and like tell people wrong things about your, your product. You can't just say, oh, you should really understand the theory of this. You have to make another argument to them, like uh, uh, good product knowledge will increase your confidence and allow you to make better sales. You, know, you have to think of another way to approach those people that come from a totally different mindset, but they're all So communication is probably the number one 
thing um, in making the transition less jarring by kind of approaching it. So I hope you've all gotten very excited and you're ready to go out there and, and have an impact. Thank you very much. So um, now if you'd like to engage, and have, we can take questions. I have a question for um, What were the mechanics of the principles of you leaving, I guess, your postdoc position and working as a startup? start? Was there like a gap of time where you had a salary and you were just kind of living under? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, that, so oh, okay. Um, is your mic working? Yeah, just the. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, the question was. What was the mechanics of actually making that transition out of an academic position into the um, startup? So for me, um, I had an assistant professorship. I'd only been doing it for like six months when I thought of the idea of the science exchange and um, applied to my combinator. And then once I found out I was accepted, I only had three weeks to get to California and start the program. So it was a three-month program that required you to move to California and live there. Um, so I had to ask my boss, who luckily was the head of the Department of Medicine, is it okay if I take three months off to go and do this company and um, see how it goes? And he was like, he actually really liked the idea of the science exchange, so luckily he was like, yeah, you should go. And he was pretty confident I would fail and come back, and then I would keep going in the lab. So I went and did the three months um, and what Y Combinator does, which is really great, is they actually give you, you know, they give you money for your company. So they um, give you $170,000 for that three month period um, to get the company off the ground. So you do have some money. We tried to be as lean as possible. The three co founders all lived in a house together. Um, we still live in that house together, which is funny because we always thought it would just be a short time period, but we ended up liking living together. And so, um, and that was actually great for bonding, right? So. Um, yeah, so the mechanics were we never were, were without salary, but we um, definitely were very lean, and we still lean, like our salaries are still way under market, um, because as a founder you're kind of delaying your um, possible gains, right? You're just sort of saying, I'm willing to take a salary cut for the potential upside. Um, and then in terms of um, what happened after those three months, you know, we raised the series, um, the initial C round of financing, and I realized, you know, I really had to commit to this, and I had to go back and tell my boss, I'm not coming back, I'm leaving. Um, so I just went back, packed up, left. <laughs> Elizabeth, as well, uh, could you talk a little bit about the expectations of your investors? At sure. what point are they looking for a return on their investment? So I think that's actually something that's really, that's a great question. That's the first time I've ever got that in question. So, um, so with our investors, we were super careful with that. Um, so for our investors, they realized that we're building a marketplace. So a marketplace takes a long time, right? It's not something that's an instant success. You have to build both sides really carefully. It's not going to be profitable for quite some time. In fact, Open Table wasn't profitable for eight years. So our, one of our key investors, Jeff Jordan from Orange and Horowitz, he, um, he's our lead investor from that venture capital firm. He was the former CEO of Open Table. So he definitely we picked people who knew that this is something that's hard. We're working with universities, they're conservative, we're not going to be profitable straight away. Uh, we're actually looking at going out and raising a series A in the next couple of weeks. And our investors have been um, really, really pleased with our progress. And we're, we're definitely not profitable yet um, by any means, but we've shown great you know, uh, traction in terms of our projects that are posted, in terms of our user base growing, our core facility engagement. And so that's what they're looking for. They're really looking for, um, you know, is this going to be profitable in sort of five to ten year horizon, not the next couple of years. But there's nothing in the agreement? Oh, no, no, no. When they write check, they don't say, I want to bank in five years? Absolutely not. So um, the way that it works, you know, for your actual financing, and you need to obviously have your legal team you know, look over these documents very carefully for you. What we did with our seed round of financing, which is a very founder friendly way to do it, is we took a convertible note. So a convertible note means that um, you put a valuation on the company um, and you actually say, I'm not doing an equity round at the moment. What you're giving me is some runway that will allow me to build the company to a reasonable level that will allow me to raise a price round, so an equity round. 
um, once you raise the equity round, if it is valued at a higher valuation than the seed round, then what your convertible note is at, then those investors still benefit because they get, you know, the, their equity converts at the rate that was set from the seed round. Um, so for us, with there's certainly absolutely no requirement. If we fail and we say we're doing our business, then we don't owe them anything. They're taking a risk by investing in us, but they obviously have the potential to. They really have to believe in you. <laughs> Chrissy. So, as scientists, we don't have any kind of financial training, and we, most scientists are not good with money either. We can see how our labs are being managed. So, how hard was it for you to start going into this, like, you know, this, like, different world? And do you wish to have to go back and do an MBA or something like that, get some financial training? Yeah, so I um, I am like the worst person for understanding all of that kind of money stuff. And if I I think when I was saying, you know, 18 months ago, I would have been like, oh my goodness, I have no idea how that works. Um, you know, I'm bad enough even with my own personal stuff. But I think with a company, you have to be very fiscally responsible. You have to understand what financial status, you know, everything is, what's coming in, what's going out. Um, so we actually have actually comes down to outsource, right? So we actually have an external accounting firm that does all of our books for us. So yeah, I mean that's not my strength. So I would say like I would feel much more comfortable knowing that he's taking care of it and each month he comes and goes over it with me. Yeah, the MBA is generally considered very optional for a lot of um, startups. Oh definitely. So most startups like I mean we are fortunate at Science Exchange that one of our founders is an MBA, but so many of my founding friends are like what are called, what are called hackers. So they're you know twenty year old computer programmers with you know no kind of financial training, and they just figure it out as they go. Um, smart guys. Just smart, you know, it's not that hard. You really can figure it out pretty easily. And there are really good tools like QuickBooks and um, a lot of like do-it-yourself accounting tools people use for small businesses as well. I mean, I found having this external accounting firm do it is actually you know, it's much more robust in terms of being able to show our investors our financial documents. They prepare all of those reports. So I think for me that gives me a sense of confidence that I know that it's legitimately, um, so, you know, done to a high enough standard for audit and all that kind of you know, requirements. Any other questions? No. Well, okay. thank. Oh, sorry, did I miss something? Do you have any experience with SBIR and STTR funding? We applied for some SBR our grants at July, and um, uh, we actually talked about SBIR in a, an earlier seminar. So, um, I don't, do you have a like a specific thing that you're interested in? Well, I'm, I, maybe this is a question for later. I'm just thinking in terms of like angel, venture capitalists, SBIR. Where do these all fit together? Where do I, what does my wife end up giving an SBIR? <laughs> SBIR yeah. grants are non dilutive funding. You yeah. should take them. Yeah. <laughs> That's what's so attractive. Super attractive. Yeah. I just recently went to an entrepreneurship academy at UC Davis, and it's like the VCs want like 50 fold return on their money. You know? That's they that's want that, doesn't necessarily yeah. mean you're going to get it. I mean, that's why they invest in so many companies. That's the whole point. Like, spread the risk, one succeeds and they win, right? Um, so, I think, you know, I would say if you have something that fits one of these BIR mechanisms, you should definitely apply. The science Exchange cannot apply. so. We um, have to be owned by an American, which I'm not American. Um, so, you know, it's a problem for us. We, we're not eligible. Um, but I would say, yeah, why not? For sure. Have you heard of Kickstarter? Yes, well, Kickstarter, yeah. I just want to say, thank you for bringing it up. There, there are businesses that, that are owned and launch on Kickstarter. Kickstarter, and there's actually some, um, some oh, research right? that's being Four done. Million? Yeah. It's crazy. So Kickstarter's great if you have something that you know you're really selling. So there was that really famous case recently with that Pebble phone thingy. I think they raised four million um, on Kickstarter. It was like amazing. But essentially, people were buying the product, right? They were looking for a return, you know, in the distant future. They were literally saying, "We're going to manufacture this product if enough people pay us." But the other interesting side of that is that. Some people are funding research via Kickstarter and other things like Petri dish. Well, that's stuff right. as well. Rocket Hub also. Rocket Hub. Yeah, Rocket Hub. So, um, yeah, people are raising money for the they, research. They're raising decent amounts of funding for research. Sure. 
if you incorporate the Delaware C Corp, you can have your startup anywhere. Of course, yeah, absolutely. So everyone incorporates as a Delaware C Corp because it has um, that state has much, you know, better regulations for our companies. So we operate in California, but we are a Delaware. Do you find that in general uh, initiatives in California? And California is great, by the way, for like uh, academic industrial relations. But uh, do you find that people in California that want to uh, foster California businesses are supportive of your business being to register in Delaware? Does it matter at all? Everyone is registered in Delaware. Oh, really? Everyone. So yeah. you can't, I mean, no one is not registered in Delaware. So it's not, that's like a complete non factor So I should forget about registering in New York. Yeah, you should register in Delaware. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, if there's no other questions, um, we're going to head to the faculty club, and whoever would like to join us is welcome to join us. So thanks, for everyone, for coming.